In the controversial book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, author John Allegro shows with an astounding attention to detail that the roots of Christianity, and in fact all religious iconography and mythology, can be traced back to one central source. Something not of a different dimension of space and time, not of some extraterrestrial force transcendent of our science and understanding, but of something much more humbled, much more interesting, the Amanita Muscaria Mushroom. In this podcast, I'll try to shed light on what I understand and or believe on the subject. With a subject so touchy and controversial as this one, where do we start? Well, at the beginning, of course. But not with the Big Bang and the creation of the universe, because that was something outside of our existence, though it is stringently linked. Let us begin with the creation of our being in the garden, for this is where we get the story of the tree of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil has fascinated me ever since my encounter with a certain fruiting body of the tree, and it reaffirmed my long-held belief that the evolution of man from primitive animal-like humanoids was not, as some speculate, a process of gene manipulation from some unknown alien being or beings, but that the very nature of early man as hunter-gatherer inevitably brought him into contact with these plant ethogens which caused an experience of death and rebirth and an evolutionary leap in consciousness. This activated and changed our DNA, separating us not from the apes, but from the primitive Neanderthal man. There's a great collection of stories called the Lost Books of the Bible, and in particular, the Forgotten Books of Eden. It tells the story of Adam and Eve once they ate of the forbidden fruit and were banished from the garden. This story reads like a caveman's guide to conscious awakening. Interesting to note that the first thing Adam does upon leaving is build a stone altar on which he burns incense as an offering. So here we have the Stone Age man using fire for the first time. Adam and Eve pray for forgiveness and re-entrance into the garden, but to no avail. So into the wilderness they go. At first they are both confused and lost in a sort of dreamlike desolation seeing the world through new eyes. They wander through the night looking for safety, which they find in the rocks. Once entering the cave systems there within, they are soon overcome by a fear of the penetrating darkness. They cry and wail for God, falling dead upon the cave floor. They pray and repent until morning when the sun finally begins to rise. But as the sun rises, they begin to panic, believing it's a fiery angel come to kill them. It's an enlightening tale of fantasy whose imagination sheds a very real light on the situation of primitive man's awakening. After all, we have never found the missing link, because in my estimation, it wasn't in the bones, it was in the brain. As a result of consciousness, man no longer needed to huddle in caves. He now knew of fire and the wheel of time. Fire in ancient times represented knowledge itself or enlightenment, thus the story of Prometheus and Lucifer, the light bearer, emerged. The changes in our physical characteristics were probably enhanced or sped up by this change alone. The shape of the skull changed with the need for increased brain power. We lost the extra hair we needed to stay warm, something that coincides with the end of the last ice age as well. Our eating habits changed, causing the Neanderthal jawline, used primarily to grind food, to fade away. This fact has been overlooked for centuries, but has been explored by many independent researchers. This newfound consciousness heralded in the age of civilization, art, mythology, and in essence, recorded history. Thus, the garden is a central myth that is echoed throughout space and time. So in the fable garden, we have the foundation of what we know today. We know what Adam and Eve represent, and we have a good assumption of what the forbidden fruit could have been. But there is one other key figure in this myth. What does the Serpent of Eden represent? This is a touchy subject for me because I was fed of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So to me, the serpent is a sinner and a saint, an angel and a devil. The image of the lizard, serpent, and dragon work on the mind a lot like Mona Lisa's smile. Science has shown that the way Leonardo drew her smile affects certain stimuli in the brain. Some see her smiling, some see her frowning. It's a trick of the eye and the mind's perception. So it's only natural that we have two theories of thought on the subject. 
Either the serpent is some sort of fallen angel reptile masquerading as an angel that created man by means of gene manipulation of primates, then tricked mankind into becoming his slaves so he and his brethren, the Anunnaki, can mine the gold from this planet while getting busy with our women. It's in the Bible, people. Look it up. Genesis chapter 6. Or since the story of the serpent is so prevalent from the far east to the far west, north and south, and every point in between, it's my assumption that the serpent is most likely a representation of the S-shape of the Milky Way galaxy. And this claim is backed up by every religious iconography, from the Hindus to the Mayans. Why was this particular myth so important? Truly this was the story of the first shamans, the first medicine men, the first gods, those who know the universal opposites of good and evil, positive and negative. It's the story of the first transcendent beings to have a consciousness expanding experience that took them beyond the temporal realm into a higher reasoning. It is the birth of spirit. It's act one of the divine human play in which nature is the author and we are the actors. And as the old quote from the Dead Poet Society goes, the powerful play goes on that you may contribute a verse. So why not just come out and say this? Why hide behind the myth and symbolism? Because the myths themselves serve a very important purpose. It's all about the initiation of our souls. As Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is spread out upon the earth and men do not see it. Truly we need this gradual climb to enlightenment because this is all too much to take in at once. If you tell someone flat out that the god they worship was a myth, whether one concerning a constellation in the sky or a psychoactive plant, and that they themselves are the god, the reaction would be no less than anarchy. But symbols, being an ancient form of communication, ease our transition from the temporal to the eternal. Symbols are so important because they evoke something within our subconscious that is unspoken and beyond our present reality and ability to explain. It's something that only can be alluded to. Symbols are meant to open you up spiritually as well as mentally. Like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a symbol is worth a thousand pictures.